Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a great show for you this evening. Uh, Kevin Lacey from Airplane Repo is here. So excited about that. And so, as always, before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. First of all, Tonight's broadcast will be recorded and will be available on YouTube. Just search for Social Flight on YouTube and you'll find the channel. Usually takes us a day or two to get that edited and up and then you can uh, see it after the show. In addition to that, of course, be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps. Our mission is to keep you flying and to support general aviation. That is so, so important, especially now in these challenging times um, with the pandemic going on. We want to make sure that we do everything possible to encourage people to safely fly, do their safe social distancing, but also support all the small businesses that keep general aviation going. And that is everything from your local FBO to airport restaurants to all the companies that actually provide uh, engines, engine overhauls, uh, our partners that you can see from the list back here, everything from headsets to you name it. If you are thinking about doing something for your aircraft, improving it with avionics, et cetera, please, please consider doing that now during this time. You might be saving someone's job and you will be doing something to help keep general aviation uh, available to us and in a healthy state when we come out the other side of this pandemic. And so it's very, very important. And of course, you can find all of that, all of those webinars and so many things, including safe in-person events that people are still doing fly-ins, et cetera, on social flight. So be sure to check that out. Now, uh, one of the things that we have started as part of this uh, show is to celebrate general aviation a little bit. And I would like to kick that off here by uh, opening up with an announcement. I asked many of you to reach out to me when you have, know of someone with a new rating or something new in aviation, let us celebrate it uh, along with everything else in general aviation. And just today, I would love to announce a very good friend of mine, um, Andrea Bertignoli uh, from over at Continental Aerospace Technologies. Uh, you know, I, I absolutely love Continental. Uh, they have been such a great supporter of everything that we do to support general aviation. And I was so thrilled to get this picture today from Andrea. Uh, about her getting her uh, her little uh, tail uh, feathers cut there as uh, doing her first solo um, uh, with the help of uh, the flight program over there at Continental. And so uh, congratulations to her. And please send me your stories at info at socialflight.com and we'll be sure to do that as well. Another great announcement that we have here is we have a winner of the Fly to Win Challenge that we run on a constant basis here at Social Flight. And the winner of Lightspeed's Zulu 3 headset uh, is Karen Mitchell, which is uh, so, so cool, of course. Karen is a high school teacher. She's also president of Win Arrow, a New Hampshire nonprofit that works to provide STEM education through aviation-related activities and events for third through 12th graders and their teachers. It was just a coincidence that uh, our kind of random selector of who wins each time selected Karen, but you know, you couldn't have a better candidate. And so we're very, very thrilled that Lightspeed will be sending a Zulu 3 out to Karen and help equip her as well as her organization there at Win Arrow. So uh, very cool. Now, just as a reminder, if you want to compete uh, for all the prizes that we have as part of Social Flight's Fly to Win Challenge, all you need to do is have the free mobile app Social Flight and then just get out there and fly. It actually gets you points for everywhere you fly and all you need to do is check in once and that is enough for you to be part of our drawing. So uh, in the next up in that, uh, a wonderful partner of ours and also of the work that Kevin Lacey is doing with his program is Tempest. And our next prize that'll be coming up is the Tempest Aero Prize Pack with all the cool things that you see here. Um, it, it's absolutely fantastic. We love both the products as well as the folks and, and it's the people behind all of these supporting products that I think is so important because they're also the people that are there when you have an issue with your aircraft. And, uh, and so uh, I definitely recommend uh, them to you. So get out there, fly, compete here for the, the uh, Tempest Prize that we have going on. Lastly, just a quick reminder of what's coming up in our upcoming broadcast. We usually do this at the end, 
but uh, we've got some requests just to keep that in the beginning. And that is next week on December 22nd, NORAD is here with the Santa Tracker. We've got uh, Rod Machado coming back on the 29th. Mark and Mike Patey will be joining us. Uh, BRS's Boris Popoff, the inventor of the whole airplane parachute, as well as flight testing with Eric Seguin and Ariel Tweedo of Flying Wild Alaska will be joining us. So let's get to tonight's guest with that. Our uh, guest, as we've said, so, so exciting, is Kevin Lacey of Airplane Repo. Kevin's aviation career began in 1973. He earned his private pilot's license in 1974 and repossessed his first airplane in 1975. So that's a quick quick little uh, move from getting your pilot's license and, and starting to swipe airplanes legally for, uh, for banks, etc. He earned his airframe and power plant mechanics license and associate's degree in 76 through the Spartan School of Aeronautics. And he went on to earn advanced flight ratings, ultimately landing him in the cockpit of a Cessna Citation, and then on to a long, long list of bigger and faster aircraft, including commercial aircraft such as Boeing, Airbus, CRJs. He has an AMP mechanics license with an inspection authorization. He's an ATP. The list of aircraft uh, that he flies include uh, 737s, beach jets, uh, you name it, uh, Dassault Falcons, uh, you, there's a long, long list. He's a flight instructor, seaplane pilot instructor, and more. I'd like to bring him out uh, on to the uh, uh, broadcast. And if you have ever watched Airplane Repo on the Discovery Channel, you've seen Kevin's work firsthand repossess repossessing aircraft from around the world. Welcome, Kevin Lacey, how are you? Hey, I'm doing good there, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, pardon the background chaos, but uh, you just happened to catch me on a club night. And, uh, you know, we let the kids do what they will when, uh, when it's time to come out to the airport. We're not hey. going to stop that for anything. No way. you got to strike while the iron's hot, especially when you get everybody together and start teaching them stuff. Well, yep. Yep. They're so, building Kevin, wing. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. You said there's a wing? I was just building a wing stand over there and trying to fix their golf cart uh, right tonight. They rolled the golf cart and kind of wrecked the batteries and the cables in it, so they're trying to fix that over there as well. Oh, it's God. kind of cold. It's cold, wet, and damp out here right now in Texas. Well, uh, uh, we'll put that in perspective because I'm, I'm guessing that cold for Texas and cold for up here in New England is a little bit different, but uh, I'll take your cold. Yeah, well, okay, <laughs> if you say so. Hey, so, um, you know, for, most people know you from Airplane Repo. We're going to talk about your background, talk about that for a little bit, and then we'll get to the program that you're running there with the kids. Um, I want to start with, with a quick uh, little uh, uh, have you ever uh, game that we just talked about. We haven't done this before, but just to let people know how crazy the things you've done in your background are, just a quick yes, no, or feel free to say pass on some of these items. So let's see here. Like, have you ever uh, taken off or landed on a dirt strip? Well, sure. Haven't okay. you? A, a, a road with airplane with with both airplanes and cars? Oh yeah. <laughs> how about how about in the snow? Uh, yep. A beach? Yep. Okay. You ever found yourself unable to land somewhere? Uh, yep. <laughs> Mud puddles. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, at risk of ruining an airplane, you know, uh, sometimes it just, you know, you have to move on, find another place. You ever lost an engine in flight? Oh, of course. How about lost an engine on the ground when you were, tr and, and couldn't find an engine when you were going to take off? Well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, uh, other folks may say that because I might have swiped an engine off an airplane and they might have come out there expecting to fly away with the airplane and uh, <laughs> lacked a little bit of thrust from one side of it. <laughs> Ever been, uh, so now most of us know you've been chased on the ground. How about in the air? Uh, well, yeah, mostly, most of the time I've been chasing the air. Some of my friends were jumping me with her T6s or something, you know, but you know, not by the cops or anything. I haven't been shot uh, down by an F-16 uh, lately. We, we, now we've seen that things get a little bit of aggressive uh, as well there. Um, ever been a, a arrested? Uh, yep. As part of your work, imprisoned? <laughs> uh, yep. Face down some military personnel? Yes, sir. Three different um, countries. Three different countries. <laughs> pissed, pissed off a foreign dictator? 
Uh, well, they're airport dictator more likely, yes. As I was going to say, local dictators and airport dictators, that pretty yes. much starts our list. So I just yeah. wanted to, to get introduced to this. Let's get started. Let's go back in time. How did you get started uh, first in, in, in the world of just becoming a pilot and a mechanic? And then we'll talk a little bit about how you got involved in the show and repo work. So how did you well, get started? I think I can kind of describe that very first part is uh, some of those old teachers back in high school said you'll never get a job staring out a window. And, you know, sitting in a cockpit of an airplane, you're staring out a window. It kind of seems like uh, they were wrong about that. But No, I was living in a crummy part of town growing up down there, and I stare out the window looking at what used to be called Redbird Airport. I forget what the but now, seeing all those airplanes coming and going, and all I could think about was, I don't know where those guys are going, don't know who they are, but I want to be one of them, get the heck out of here. <laughs> so, nice. uh, I find myself going to the airport on a regular basis, and, you know, one guy tried to throw a broomstick through my, through my uh, bicycle spokes, and I sped away. A couple of days later, it was by the same hangar, and he yelled at me, hey, kid get over here. Next thing I know, I was sweeping the hangar floor out, wiping the belly of his airplane down, going for an airplane ride. The absolute quintessential, like, we'll work and wash airplanes to get started, huh? Well, yep, that's it. We'll fly for food. <laughs> now, now, you became, were you a mechanic? Did you go through your mechanics training before uh, you became a pilot? Uh, well, I started taking lessons while I was in high school, and while I was in high school, I started looking in the back of flying magazines and, uh, you know, AOPA and whatever, looking for a way to advance my career. I uh, really got sparked in getting my career advanced. At first, it began just getting out of town. Then it began, and I think it was September of 73, they had this little dedication ceremony for this new airport locally here, and, uh... I'd been using this nice long strip of ass of concrete uh, as a practice takeoff and landing strip. And so when I heard about this dedication ceremony for this little airport they were going to build, I decided to drive out there. And when I got out there, I realized that this was the landing strip I'd been using. And I was blown away that, you know, when I, as soon as I walked out the door to the terminal, there's a regal converse standing tall in her struts over there with those big, big air paddles, you know, on the side of those engines. And I was looking at that airplane thinking, holy cow, that little girl does not belong on this ramp because right next to it was a Boeing 707. And that thing was shiny. It was American Airlines 707. And I just wandered up the air stairs and sat down in that cockpit. Nobody there to molest me or bother me or anything. And I sat there and played with that airplane and looked at the cockpit and the dials and the flight engineer's desk and flip charts that were everywhere. And I thought, my God, I'm too dumb to be smart enough to know how to work all this stuff. But, you know, this might be. So as I walk out this, you know, 707 and wander around underneath it looking at it, I realized why there was nobody over here because there was a crowd over there next to me with Fat Albert, which was Braniff International's big orange 747. And I wandered around that airplane, but I wasn't going to go aboard it because the line for that one was way around the tail of the airplane. But wandering around just marveling at the engineering of that big old 747, you know, the landing gear and way all that works, I was just fascinated with it. And when I walked around to the other side, I just was stopped in my tracks. I thought I went back to the cartoon show the Jetsons or something because there was the Concorde sitting there. Oh my and God. That absolutely blew me away. And when I left DFW airport that day, I knew my career goal was going to be to climb in those airplanes and start flying them. But uh, my high school counselor advised me and tried to help me get into the military because that was the only way to do it. And those boys over at the military recruiters kind of suggested that uh, we weren't real bright about what we were doing because they were closing down this little party in Southeast Asia and it'd probably be best if I struck off in the civilian world. So we started off uh, hunting for schools to go to after, uh, after high school and wound up having interviews with the guys from Spartan School of Aeronautics up there in Tulsa. They came down to the house, and I mean, I'd been working, you know, I'd had two jobs all do through high school, and I spent my money at the weekends at the airport. So all summer, I saved my money so I could pay tuition to go to flight training up in Spartan. Unfortunately, when I got up there, uh, <clears throat> they 
sent me to the, you know, well, you're at the wrong campus. You need to be over at Pine Street. So saddle up and go because uh, they close down here pretty quick and you're going to be late for registration. So I saddled up and hauled ass across town, got over there, signed up for class and sitting down there in class, reflecting back upon all the stuff I saw in that 707 cockpit, the flight engineer dials, the flip charts and all the math stuff looking in there. I realized that, well, this is pretty intense math that we're doing here, you know, in the first three weeks of school. It must be required for, for this flying stuff. But, uh, you know, by the way, hey, uh, when do we get to start flying? And the instructor looked at me and he just looked around the room and he, anybody else in here? And there was about three kids. We're all fresh out of high school, still dripping wet behind our ears, you know, still hanging on mama's tit almost, you know. And we, <laughs> and we, we wind up out there. and. We're in A&P school. He informs us that we're in A&P school. The school allocated all its GI Bill resources in the flight training department for the guys coming back from Southeast Asia. And in their a logarithm, if you will call it that, of successes and failures, those of us that are paying our own way are likely not to make it. So they're forecasting out a year and a half in advance with all their resources, airplanes, instructors, and what have you. And they just decided on their own that I would be better off in A&P school. And so they said, well, if you guys will stick it out in A&P school, we'll help you through your flight training. Well, they didn't help us through flight training. I finally did it all on my own, but uh, did wind up walking out of there with a bunch of experience. I got a job at the local airport working on little airplanes and, you know, drilling rivets is what he started me out at. And next thing I know, I was assembling and, you know, 19 years old, I'm the chief test pilot for a little rebuild outfit. <laughs> and that was kind of cool. But, you know, it was, I went to night school till midnight, got up at six o'clock in the morning, was at the airport at seven and, you know, just full tilt boogie the whole time, having having a blast, living the dream. Wow! Now, in your now in your in your background, it says like right, pretty much right after within a year of getting your license, you actually did your first repossession. How did that happen? Yeah. Well, by by now, the uh, little airport that I was working at, the little FBO, you know, we did annuals and we rebuilt wrecked airplanes, and we had a couple little rental airplanes. And so oftentimes he'd throw me the keys to one little, you know, to an assessment of some sort or something and say, hey, take a one, two Sierras, for example, and go over here to Paw Huska and switch out this airplane for so-and-so airplane, bring it back. We've got to do an annual on it. And so I was constantly ferrying airplanes around. And so one day he pipes up with this unusual demand and he gives me a bucket of keys and tells me to go find this airplane, November 11329. But he didn't know what airport it was at. He just said, it's out here in eastern Oklahoma somewhere. Go down to Pryor, go over here to Tahlequah, go up here. You know, just It's out there somewhere. Just go hunt, hunt it down and don't come home until you find it. Oh, well, okay. Well, you know, you want me to leave 1-2 Sierra down there? No, 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 no. Take Rick or somebody. Well, Rick's a student pilot. That's cross country. He can't do that. Ah, nobody will know. Go for it. <laughs> okay. And this is back in the day when nobody, uh, when you didn't have to do an insurance form to go fly every airplane. This is back in the day when you just saddled up and, you know, if you can figure out how to start the engine, you flew it. You know, just don't forget to put the wheels down, Kev. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, it was uh, it was quite interesting times that, you know, back then. And you know, we wound up in, I forget what airport it was. We, we hit Tahlequah, drove around the ramp out there. I didn't see it. We took off, went to Muskogee, didn't see it there. And finally found it in Wagner, Oklahoma, and pulled right up next to it. Holy cow. And about Rick started untying the airplane, doing the pre-flight on it. I'm picking the lock on the airplane, and I finally got it. Dang, this thing almost new. It was like a 73 model Cessna 150, man. I've never been anything that new. Tube steel landing gear and everything. So uh, we saddled that thing up and played chase. We went down the river, flying down the riverbed, chasing each other back over to Sand Springs, Oklahoma. <laughs> Excuse me. We got back to the airport. And the boss wasn't there, you know, of course, a little old country airport, the hangar's wide open, you know, we pull up there, we're all proud of ourselves, you know, we got the airplane back. Well, you know what we ought to do, Rick? Yeah, what? We ought to go ahead and take this thing apart and get the oil draining, get the mags out, do a compression check, you know, we're probably bringing it in for an annual, you know, we did. <laughs> we ripped this airplane to pieces. I mean, we got the seats out of it, we got the cowling off, oil draining on it, when the boss man wanders back into the hangar with the banker dude. 
they walk into the hangar and see the airplane all ripped to pieces and bleeding oil on the ground, on the floor, compression check going on, the seats out, the flaps down, panels off of it. What in the hell are you turkeys think you're doing? Uh, we're doing an annual inspection on it, boss. Ain't that what you sent us to go get it for? Uh, no. And the banker dude was just laughing. I mean, this was Disco Danny. I mean, he was wearing these three-piece maroon suit, got a shag haircut with a, shag, with a goatee, red hair. I mean, it was Disco Danny all over the top, you know. And I, he was just over there rolling on the floor laughing. It was so funny to him. Boss man was kind of upset. So, anyway, she... After they all wandered off the next day, you know, I said, well, you know, I think I think it's time to go to school. So I just got in the truck and left and went to school. Next day, boss man, why are you so mad at me? He says, well, he says, I didn't need you to take the airplane part. Well, didn't you send us out to go get it to bring it in for an annual? He goes, well, no, that was a repossession. I said, repossession? I said, well, why the hell did you tell me? He goes, would you have done it? I said, well, uh, I don't know. I never, you know, never had that opportunity or that that, that question asked of me. So, anyway, there you have it. That was my first, and it was quite entertaining for me. Anyway, to look back on it and go, holy cow! So, so how did you then go from that one experience to to starting to do it more as a profession? Unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, uh, what was it, in the mid-80s, I guess it was, uh, well, let's see, you know, fast forward up into the 80s now, uh, I've gone to, I, I was a director of maintenance for a flight school, then I wound up being a director of maintenance for a little charter outfit, hauling the mail around, and I uh, got to fly a bunch of Barons, Bonanzas, and all kinds of stuff, and got my ratings eventually, uh, earned those ratings, but couldn't find a job anywhere. Uh, so I wandered into a, a corporate jet operation. It was a FBO named Jet Fleet, looking for a looking for a, a flying job. And of course, they said there was no flying jobs available, and they sent me out the door. And as I was walking down out, down the stairs out the door, trying to go out to the side door, one of the maintenance guys said, "Hey, what are you doing over here?" Well, I was kind of looking for a job. And he walks over there and hands me a rivet, and he says, "What's that?" And I said, "That's a 426. It looks like a 4-4." And he goes, oh, okay, you you looking for a job, yep. Yeah, uh, so anyway, he, he said, who'd you talk to? I said, well, some little gal upstairs up there. He said, I'll be right back. He came back down, and the next thing I know, I'm in the shop working on Falcons and Learjets and learning these airplanes too. So, you know, if you will, I kind of – kind of learned each airplane from the toolbox inside out and learned them all from working on them before I got to fly them. But a few years later, I uh, wound up getting in trouble multiple times over there and uh, they decided we weren't going to be partners in aviation maintenance anymore. And now I was working out of the back of my pickup truck and I found a bunch of dealers that were having troubles with some of the airplanes they'd sold and they needed some help getting them all back. And so next thing I know, it was Katie Bar the Doors. It was, you know, they were hiring, they were hiring pilots and they were saying, hey, why don't you guys, uh, you know, let me go pick that stuff up. I don't know, Kev, you're way too valuable in, in the hangar, in the maintenance shop. You need to be out here taking care of these airplanes. Pilots are dying a dozen. Okay, now, well, yeah, but, you know, the last four you sent out didn't come back with the airplane. Yeah. So next thing I know, they said, well, they looked at me, you think you can do it? I said, well, sure I can. So next thing I know, I was swiping airplanes left and right, going every which way from Sunday. And, you know, I actually got shot at a couple times and uh, picking up some old airplanes out of some farmer, uh, out of some crop duster scripts. And one of them was kind of entertaining in that I brought the airplane back and did a nickel and dime patch on the side of it, you know. And then I, interestingly enough, got a call, said, hey, there's a guy coming to town who wants to look at that old 172 you picked up. Well, okay, then. Turned out to be the sheriff. Turned out to be the sheriff of this little town called Lacey, Texas. <laughs> So I went out and flew it around with him and brought it back, showed him the bullet holes in the back of it. He said, I'll take it. <laughs> and off he went with it. You know, so it was kind of entertaining. But, uh, yeah. you know, you during that? you're saying that you flew all these different types of planes. How did you how did you move up through all those different planes? Did you just teach yourself or do you have checkouts or how does that work? 
Well, no, you know, if you read the FARs, you know, you've got to check yourself out in an airplane before saddling up and going. We didn't back then really have to go follow the insurance company's requirements and guidelines and fill out a 10 page form and give them a colonoscopy to do that. You know, I mean, it was just, you know, jump in the airplane and go. And that's the way it was. You know, yeah, I can figure out how to start a big continental, even if, even when it's hot. Well, okay, you're good. Take off and go for it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I had a guy throw the keys to the twin Comanche to me. All I'd ever flown is was, the twin was an old uh, uh, Piper Apache getting my rating. Well, jumping in that twin Comanche was a waking, eye waking, and uh, eye opening experience there, you know, because it's a little feisty. It's got uh, some different characteristics. And it took a little bit of a while for me to teach myself how to properly fly that airplane, but, but I did. You know, so it was, you know, you just, they're airplanes, they're wings, they got gear handles and they got engines. And once you can figure that out, now I wouldn't say that today because they got too many glass panels and too many integrated avionics in them that you can't even turn the radio on without, you know, but, but anyway, back in the day, it was a, it was a Katie bar the door, just go, go jump in it. You ever flown a 421 before? No, just don't backlash the motors and go get it. Okay. <laughs> what the hell backlash, man? <laughs> now, what about, I mean, there's got to be some basics around that. Did, it, did you have for, any kind of formal tail dragger training, or how did you get into turbines, too? Well, you know, the interesting story about tail draggers, uh, when I was a kid back there in that little podunk airport in Sand Springs, Oklahoma, while I was working for that guy where I swiped my first airplanes from, we also went out and picked up wrecked airplanes and then we rebuilt them and what have you. And on one of the adventures going out to try to find airplane parts for Bonanza project we had, there was this little tailor craft sitting out back of the barn back there where this little grass strip was and it was upside down. And it had a rope tied around the prop. And I looked at that and kept looking at it. And all I could figure was from the drag marks in the ground out there, they must have drug that thing from over here, over by the barn, upside down with the tow hitch on the back of the pickup truck. So there's a little tailor craft sitting out there. And the boss could not get me to have, give him a hand searching through the barn for the parts of the bonanza we needed. So, you know, finally, it was about time to go. And I was said, hey, boss man. You know, I'm interested in this airplane here. Uh, you know, we'll go go talk to the guy. Then. He put me put me in. I'm 19 years old. He put me in the fire there right off the get go. So I went in and talked to the guy and asked him about it. And he, I want 3,500 bucks for it. And I told him, well, I can't come up with 3,500 bucks. I can give you 500. He says, no, no way. He goes, I'll take 2,000. I said, I'll give you 1,500. So next thing it was, I went back to Tulsa and sold my dang car. So I come up with enough money to buy this wrecked airplane. And then I bought me a $200 motorcycle and I bought me this Taylor craft. And <laughs> so I went back down and hauled the Taylor craft back up to the Sand Springs and I noodled with it and got the engine running. I got the, took the engine apart and built the, rebuilt the uh, engine out and straightened that up. Got some more pieces to it and fixed what needed to be fixed. Took the prop down to the prop shop and get it straightened. But I still hadn't welded up the wing struts and got that straight yet. So. But I got the motor ready to run, so now everybody's gone to lunch, leaves me there by myself. So I'm going to try to fire this thing up. Well, first thing it did was took off running away from me and damn near hit the gas pump on the other side of the ramp as I was chasing it down. <laughs> and I finally caught the tail of it and steered it away from the gas pump. And when it got off into the weeds between the runway and the taxiway, uh, it just slowed it down just enough so I could catch up to it and get to the door and pull the throttle back. Well, as long as I got it running, I might as well taxi it around a little bit. So, this flying his tail draggers can't be all that hard. You know, everybody brags about how tough it is. You know, Jay and his Luscom over there, you know, those guys are always picking on me about flying these nose wheel airplanes. So, I decided I'm just going to taxi this whole thing on down and taxi onto the runway and see what happens. So, I get onto the runway, power it up tail in the air boy she starts bunny hopping to the side one side oh crap this thing's up i'm on the <laughs> runner pedals doing a texas two step like nobody's business and uh finally off the side of the runway i go swirl around the windsock twice and then finally come to a rest and i boy i'm going to clean the bitches out so you know after about three tours around the windsock with the little tailor craft you know i come taxiing back up there to the to the hangar and Everybody's laughing at me because they just come back from lunch and saw that last rodeo around there. Uh, you moron, you ought to put the wings on it. It'd be much more controllable with the wings on it. And, well, okay then. 
So after I put the wings on it, uh, welded up the wing struts and got that stuff done, put the wings on it, went out there and jumped. Hey, it was pretty easy to fly. So several years later, everybody's looking in my dead gum logbook saying, well, you don't even have a tailwheel endorsement. Uh, well, I didn't know you had to have one. And <laughs> you didn't. back then you didn't. And so I guess I checked myself out in the tailwheel airplanes and, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Go figure. Now, now, when did you, so tell me how you transitioned to real full-time repo and then, and then how the show started. Well, again, like I said, you know, uh, I, over the period of time, I just accumulated uh, friends and contacts in the finance, aviation finance industry and some pretty big names. And, you know, as we all grow up, we kind of grow up and they wind up moving into bigger positions and, you know, financing bigger aircraft and what have you. And it's just kind of the way it is. I started a full-blown FBO down here in, in Dallas with uh, two repossessed Learjets. And, and that turned into a 10-year nightmare, but actually it was a lot of fun. But, you know, it had 65 employees, but it wound up being about 200 problems because I knew about every single kid's problem with the whole organization. But, you know, it was a, it was a test of wills with the airport authorities, you know, with the uh, FAA earning an air carrier certificate, you know, from scratch, writing all the books, writing the manuals, getting a repair station certificate. And, you know, I had done that primarily because I could not find facilities that I could trust to take these repossessed jets to and provide them with the care and feeding necessary during a preservation program. You know, you got to pull the batteries, you got to do a variety of different things to maintain these aircraft in airworthy condition if you're going to park them for a while. And so uh, that's kind of the genesis of starting the FBO. And it turned into be a pretty good deal. People thought I was nuts. What in the hell do you think you're doing? You're starting an FBO with repossessed airplanes and all this. This is a stupid business model. I said, no kidding. You think it is? Well, let me see how this works. First off, the bank pays me to go swipe the dang airplane. Then they pay this. They pay me to bring the airplane home, care and feed for that little dumpling. They care the batteries charged up. Go run the engines every ten days or whatever the you know frequency happens to be for that airplane. Uh, in the meantime, when we present the aircraft to a potential customer, they wind up being a customer of ours because we're pretty smart and we know these airplanes real well. And so now the repossessed airplanes now become somebody else's airplanes and then they bring them back to us for maintenance. And it just perpetuates itself along. And, you know, so it, I thought it was a pretty decent business model, but I never even considered it to be one. Uh, that just It's just the way it worked out. So... And, and then at what, point, at what point did, did the show come into play of airplane repo? Jeez. Well, I don't know. I kept getting these clandestine calls from people, you know, over the years. And I probably got five or six calls, you know, over the four or five year period of time. And I just kept telling them no. And I'd hang up. Yeah. Tell them no. And I'd hang up. So I think I'd just gotten back from Africa where I'd captured a 747. And I'd spent nine months over there with that rodeo. And I finally delivered that airplane to uh, Karachi, Pakistan, I think it was. And I mean, I was dead beat tired when I got home. All I wanted to do is go to the hangar, play with my sailor craft and noodle around. And pretty soon this van full of, two vans full of people show up and they jump out of their van and I don't know who they were or where they came from. And they got all this camera gear and they're just starting to video all around the dang hangar. Who the hell do you guys think you are? Well, we're so and so, and we did videos for the deadliest catch, and we think you'd be great on TV. Oh, not me, no. Go away. Get out of my hangar. Go away. So, you know, next thing I know, uh, they put together a little sizzle reel, and they saw the TV over here at the hangar, and they plugged that thing in. And they said, "Here, come here, come over here and watch this." And in the meantime, it was just a typical day at Arrow Country. You know, T6s are smoking the runway over there. You know, I've gone out and flown my Taylor craft a little bit. And, you know, I mean, just an every you know, just an ordinary day and Saturday afternoon at the airport. And they put this little sizzle reel on there. My girlfriend wanders up and she's sitting here. She goes, what's going on? I said, I don't know. These guys have been filming Deadliest Catch and they think they want to do a TV show about me. You know, I don't know. So anyway, they sat down and started trying to convince me to do this TV show. And she turned around and looked at me. She goes, well, hell, you done everything else. You may as well give this a shot, too. You know? I said, well, I haven't done anything, everything else, but, you know, so I turned around and looked at him and I said, hey, look, 
I get to view everything before you even go to print. I mean, I mean, I'm going to look at everything that you do because I'm not going to let you look, make me look stupid. And, you know, I mean, there's things that I will or will not let you video. And there's things that, uh, and so they, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, anything you want, any, whatever you say, whatever you say. Well, that turned out to be kind of bogus, but, you know, at the end of the day, I wound up, at the end of the day, I wound up doing three seasons worth of it. And, you know, it's uh, pretty scary when, you know, you got 12 people chasing, running around with cameras and what have you, and you've got to be responsible for every one of them. Hey, hey, get that, get that guy. What, what, stop it. We're filming it. I don't give a shit. This guy's about to walk back into a moving propeller. Get him, grab him. <laughs> so many stupid things, you know, and then they want to try to stir things up. No, we're not doing that. No, we're not doing this. No, this is what happened. This is the way we're filming it. You don't like it? I'm going home. And so we probably had some a lot of friction between us, you know, for three seasons, uh, just simply because I wasn't going to do stupid little things that they kept trying to interject into a story. And, you know, some, some reason, I just don't understand what these guys in these little booths do with these dark rooms where they do this video and editing, you know, cause I mean, I damn near hit a herd of deer in a citation on landing. And it was like, you know, on landing, going, oh shit, deer, go around. Power, gear up, slap so approach, ride the stick shaker, trying to get the airplane to go. And three different cameras, three different views, a herd of deer in the headlights. Deer in the headlight from a Central Texas Hill Country uh, runway down there. And it's clearly visible in all the cameras, but it never made it on air. <laughs> oh, God. Now, Forgive me if I'm, you know, being facetious here, but, you know, I guess they didn't see any drama in that, but <laughs> I, I certainly did. You know, I had to clean my britches out afterwards. I didn't want to bring that airplane back with a deer strike. I've seen what deer can do to an airplane. So how do you, you know, obviously you've got a team there that wants excitement and things like that. How do you balance the the, the drama of of what's on the show with compliance obviously with the FARs I mean you're not I assume you're not flying un like like illegal aircraft in terms of like uh, 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 aircraft that without ferry permits or or that aren't airworthy or, or or is there gray area what's going on well my I have what's called a PMI he's a primary a principal maintenance inspector with the FAA and we were at a, our inspection authorization renewal uh, seminar Oh, several years back, and I was just standing there talking to my PMI, just shooting the breeze. And so several people came over and says, "Hey, so you're his PMI? How do you feel about him swiping all these dang airplanes?" He goes, "He's been doing this for years. <laughs> he's been doing it for years." Good thing about what he's doing right there is he's saving me from having to go after the bad guys myself. Because typically they haven't done their maintenance. They're running a bootleg or illegal charter company. They're doing something illegal. And, you know, so, and, you know, but but I, I kind of got an idea. I can tell if an airplane is safe to go or not. I can get a, I can get a ferry permit pretty quick. I know how to do that. Uh, yeah, I've gotten ferry permits for 747s, for 737s, for, you know, Piper Cubs. And so it's no real big deal. And if I realize that I've got a scenario where I'm going to have to get one, well, then I will get one before I even leave. Right. And I'll have one in hand before I even go to see the airplane if I have that sneaky suspicion. Right. And if it's uh, if worse than that, then I'll go get a truck and trailer. <laughs> so, you know. Well, that seems to be the key, right? I mean, you've got this incredibly balanced uh, uh, experience level of being an AMP and IA, having the connection with your PMI at the FAA, and then also, of course, being a very experienced pilot. That that lets you get there and assess an airplane, and and make your own maintenance decisions on the spot. What what are some of the toughest situations you've been in with that? But you've you've managed to get the airplane repaired and out of there. Oh, good Lord. Uh, beats the crap out of me, you know. I mean, I'm sorry, but there's been just too many. <laughs> there's been a lot of there's been a lot of them. I mean, I had a I busted a windshield on a Boeing 737 coming out of Brazil, but that was, you know, it was like I've been already been detained for nine months. And I had been wrestling with that airplane, going out and running a preservation program on it. I've been detained by the Jacinta Federal from Brazil. 
and they weren't going to let they took my passport weren't going to let me out of the country uh and i've been trying to maintain the airplane and one day i got the damn tires flat and next day you know there's there's always something going on with you know down there in the amazon rainforest and so i mean i wound up with a stuck thrust lever on on the right engine and i wound up with an apu that took a dump on me and so i'm out there jerry rigging actually it wasn't the apu the apu ran fine it was the fuel it was the fuel valve up in the left hand wheel well that would not open or close but if that valve wouldn't open or close it wouldn't let the apu inlet door open so the apu inlet door to get the air in it wouldn't fire up to start because that's the next in the sequence the door opens and the starter hits and then it fires up and it runs so i found myself uh pulling the connector apart and jamming wires between a couple of the pins on the uh connector and that would run the motor open for the door and then the apu would fire up it, and then I wound up with an air start valve that wouldn't open for the, uh, I can't remember which engine it was, one of the engines. So if I got it out of sequence, starting the engine wrong, then I couldn't get the other engine to start. I could get one started, I couldn't get the other. And I never did figure out what the source of that problem was, but I did get the airplane home by starting the right engine and then the left after the APU. And then running back down there and re disconnecting the uh, cannon plug for the what you call it, and then hooking that all back up with the fuel valve. The boys down there thought I was nuts. So, but you know, I figured out how to get it done. I had a maintenance manual, wiring diagrams. It was, you know, just a matter of troubleshooting. Yeah, troubleshooting a 737, right? In a rainforest with a rusty pair of pliers and a ball peen <laughs> hammer. Pardon me, it was a claw hammer. That's crazy. I mean, well, you basically duct tape and and alligator uh, clamps and wiring to get that thing out of there? I don't use duct tape on, on the airplanes. I use speed tape on those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's that red green show? If the gals don't find you handsome, at least they'll find you handy. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. That's so, got, I mean, uh, you know, I've had to crawl out of airplanes before, you know, and, and jump uh, motor flow pressure switches and things of that nature, you know, just because the engine wouldn't start, you know. And, uh, and it's a simple fix if you know what if you're experienced enough at the airplane and understand it you know so uh it's been a lot of fun and you know looking back on the illustrious career i don't you know i was disappointed that i never got to an airline cockpit and never got to be an airline pilot which was what my goal was from high school but it just weren't in the cards but if i was to asked to trade anything in my life i don't think i would just because of the experience and the in the fun i've had I, I mean, I, uh, fun. i'm gonna i'm gonna guess that there's a lot of airline pilots right now on the line watching the show that uh that are saying just the opposite they're saying you know what <laughs> well you, you didn't miss anything of being on the flight deck that way being on the flight deck the way you were uh that's a whole different ball of wax well, yeah, but you know, uh, one of my buddies was uh, working for a local airline down here, and, and you know, he flew like three days a week. He said, "Kev, this is the best part-time job I ever had." Of course, he didn't do anything except sit around and drink beer the rest of the time, you know. And I figured, you know, the way I was, I'd have flown three days a week for them, and I'd have been out making money doing something else the rest of the week, you know. But that was it's just the way it works. Now, when you fly. Big planes like that. Do you have another? Do you have a, a, someone else going with you? Obviously, an additional crew. Uh, yes, sir. I should say yes. <laughs> Are you giving me the legal answer to that question only? <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, the first, the first type-rated pilot for single-engine 737 flight. <laughs> single pilot. <laughs> well, I have to, I have to a 73 single pilot, but. Uh, well, we'll just uh, plead the fifth on the rest of them. Fair enough. <laughs> That's, uh, that, that is definitely impressive. Now, have you found as you, uh, it, it, you know, as the show started to take off, um, that it became a little bit more difficult to be incognito doing that job of repossession, that people see you anywhere within a, a mile of an airport and, and they wonder whose plane you're going after? No, actually, they're actually trying to second. Get, they're trying to guess which one it is, and they're half the time they're right. And I mean, hey, can we help you? What can we do to help? Where's the cameras? You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, 
<laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> where, where are all the cameras at? Well, we didn't bring any cameras on this one, you know, but, uh, you know, I've had some folks uh, find out that I was hunting for their airplane and they've, they've hopscotched those things all over the place, just try to stay one airport ahead of me. And uh, eventually one guy, one guy tore his nose gear all apart and he had his cowling off and stashed it in a hangar didn't think i could find figure out which airport he was at but i did and he didn't figure out i would figure that i would be able to put it all back together and fly it away and i did <laughs> and, and that was all under the auspices of the local sheriff standing there watching me and it was pretty entertaining but uh man you're going to get one up on this guy man we've been trying to get him for a long time you've got one up on him now i can't i, I believe it when i see you fly away sheriff called left a voice message on my cell phone after i left the airport he says i'll be down <laughs> i gotta tell you as a fellow mechanic there is no one's toolbox i would rather see in the world than yours because whatever is in there that that must be every every tool must tell a story of how it's gotten you out of a jam in there. Well, I don't know. Maybe you, I probably can't find that tool because these youngsters seem to scatter them all over the airport nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, you know, they 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 understand the value in my favorite pair of, of uh, dikes. You know, I mean, that thing those went missing for I bet six months, and they went out and bought me two new pair, but they weren't my same old dikes. So you know what? I wanted my old dikes back. And finally, after doing some cleanup around the hangar here, we finally found them. And they go, hey, look what we found. Oh, boy. It was like, ah, oh, I finally got them back. You know? But it's it's kind of humorous. Jeez. And uh, let's see, there's a couple of ones that people have asked us to ask you a little bit about. One was that you had that uh, that was electrical failure that was on a, on a night repo that you had. Um, you recall that particular one and, or, or anything to, t to say about that? Apparently that uh, uh, no, but I've had electrical failures before, but I don't believe I did one on TV. Was that no? <laughs> I know there was another one that that we've been asked about that you did through the snow. That was in like three foot snow or something like that. You went out there and took a plane out. Oh, would that be up in uh, Colorado or something with a citation and having a bleed air over heat light come on, trying to get out of there with that airplane? Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. Well, that was a whole different one, but I was thinking you were, might have been referring to the one where I grabbed that 414 with no radios in it. Now, had that guy given me a legitimate invoice for that avionics install, I would have paid him. I'd have paid him for the damn thing. I'd have wrote, so here you go. But he gives me a, he gives me an invoice for three hundred thousand dollars for a Garmin installation on a 414. Dude, you, you screw you. Anyway. <laughs> He had already got all the racks in there. He'd already done all the wiring, he had all the avionics in it, but he swipes the avionics out of the airplane thinking he's going to hold these and you ain't going anywhere without this. Well, yeah, sure, I can get out of here without it. I don't need those radios. The fun part is, is I go out for 15 grand and I buy radios off of eBay and stick them in the panel and they're all wired up ready to go and he, he gave me an invoice for 60 grand out of paid him he gave me an invoice for 300 or 260,000 i think is what it was i wasn't gonna pay that that's ransom yeah the banker man is here yeah we can hose him down no we ain't you know so are you are part you of my gig is also part of my gig is also to defend and represent my client you know and to yep. look after their best interests and that not to open their checkbook up right. and you know give their money away to people just because now, now you've had to hide so, you know, sometimes. You've had to hide sometimes as well on the show from people. Is that the case? Inside airplanes or around? Inside and out. Sometimes you know, it's just it's just easier to avoid having to have dialogue with somebody who wants to who who has no business with what your business is. You mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, and oftentimes, yeah, you know, oftentimes a big part of this is you know you go to the airport and you know there's two large airplanes on the airport and there's one or two kids pumping gas or you know line service guys you know or whatever and the guy flying that airplane to them he's gone and they'll do anything in the world to protect them and defend them you know so they're all happy to you know look average so you go over there and you say hey i'm gonna swipe old so-and-so's airplane oh shoot <laughs> no you're not and they'll pull their guns out at you well you know because that guy came back from a trip and gave him the leftover catering tray you know with shrimp and you know cheese on it and whatever <laughs> So, you know, that's just the way it is. And, you know, if, if you just have to sneak in and get the airplane while they're not watching, that's, it's, all, it's, it's all that much easier. 
oftentimes, yep. you know, you, you, you go in to get an airplane, you know, you're trying to be polite. You call the people up. Yeah, well, I'm here. I'm so-and-so. I'm representing so-and-so. And, you know, I think I need to pick up your asset. Uh, that's what I'm sent here for. Well, I'll be there in about an hour. Okay, well, thank you. In the meantime, they go to the bank. They go over to the court. They file for bankruptcy. Then they get a, t- a temporary restraining order out on you. And then they come out to the airport with the sheriff and this TRO, go, nah, 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 you know, so now it turns into a six month court battle, you know. And, you know, the, in the meantime, the asset, they took the engine off of it, they blew it up, they're flying it around, they're doing whatever, you know, whatever they want to do with it. And, and so that's not in our client's best interest. Right. Did they right. just turn the black lights on back there? Hey, yeah, guys, that's all right. Y'all turn those lights off back there real quick, please. <laughs> you're blind. You're, you're washing out. The, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> no worries at all. So, are you still doing any any repo work? Yeah, I pick up a few here and there. Uh, uh, a lot of these things, you know, contrary to what the TV show makes it look like, is like being a you know a half a day ordeal or twenty you know twenty minute ordeal. It's generally a, a two or three week ordeal, you know, start, first start doing your homework, getting all your paperwork in order, getting doing all your due diligence before you go to go to swipe on. So it's not a 30 minute ordeal like it shows on TV, but uh, I've kind of got myself wrapped around the axle pretty good with these youngsters over here at the Aero Club. And I've decided that, you know, if I can't knock one out really quick and if I don't have to go to a foreign country to do it, well, I'm just going to stick around here local in North Texas so I can be here for these youngsters. Right. Let's talk about that for a minute now. Um, the, the work that you're doing right now with the Tango 31 Aero Club is is really fantastic. So tell me about the club, where it started. I mean, obviously, you're, you're doing a lot to help uh, help young people get involved in aviation in both maintenance and in flying. Well, it kind of got started, uh, as, well, it's sort of a long story, but, you know, I've done a bunch of young Eagle flights. I've got the old Slowhawk, the old 172 over there that I've had for several years and we used to do just a bunch of young eagle flights and so the local high school had a class that was at, actually at an airport uh and i helped get that program started where they were part of the eagle's nest project so i spent two years over there with them doing the eagle's nest project which is building an rv-12 so the first rv-12 over here at the local high school got built and i stepped aside as a mentor because this went on for two years, but after school, before I could get over here to my home base airport at Aero Country, these cars, all these kids would be over here, and they go, hey, can we hang out with you? You're, sure, you're a lot more fun. You got anything around here we could do? And so, so next thing I know, a buddy of mine who was used to be a U-2 pilot and I were sitting here, and uh, we decided, uh, well, you know, Spanky was his name. He goes, gee, Kev, we got to find something for these kids to do. What do you think? What do you think? I said, well, we got to get them a project. So next thing I know, I called buddy of mine, old Michael Z down there in Lakeland with the Lakeland Aero Club to get some tips on how to start up a legitimate aero club from him. And Michael's been a great job with the Lakeland Aero Club down there. And he was real helpful for me to kind of showed me the path to get the 501c3 nonprofit set up and get that organized organized and get that going and then next thing i knew it was just a word of mouth me trying to find something for these youngsters to do and so the first airplane showed up over here on a trailer it was an old 67 model cessna 150 and these youngsters got busy with it and they went to town on it and i of course stood over them and supervised them and of course i could see that they were starting to lose interest in it and you know i mean it was just it was project burnout i think if you would call it so uh along the way somebody come come up and asked us if we were interested in a glass air three kit project about 80 percent complete and sure we're interested in that so we write a little tax donation receipt give it to them wheel it over here to the hangar and as much as my ego said build this fast little sucker let's go I thought that these youngsters don't need something like this right now, so we need something they can fly. So mm-hmm. I sold it and then bought a we we bought a uh, seventy six model Cessna one hundred and fifty, which affectionately became known as three five ugly. And uh, I'll show a so picture of that it. right here. Let's bring so, up. Uh, there you go. There's three five ugly. That's three five ugly right there. So that was pretty cool. 
And so when we got Casper done, we had 3.5 Ugly and Casper, but Casper turned out to be a really pretty little airplane. They did the engine, they did the avionics, they did the uh, the paint job on the airplane, and it turned out to be great. We flew those airplanes to Oshkosh a couple times, and they flew to all the local little air shows around here. And, you know, they might take the slow hawk and fill them up with some other kids. You know, the kids are taking their flying lessons. They get to, uh, they invest their sweat equity into the restoration and maintenance of these little airplanes. And in return, they get to fly them for a price of fuel. So long as the Bank of Kevin can hold out. <laughs> and uh, so far, uh, we've been doing pretty good with it. We've started to get more recognition, a lot more donations. And so the youngsters took Free Five Ugly here just this last uh, summer. And when they found out Oshkosh was canceled, they showed up without any supervision from me and started swapping paint stripper all over the airplane. And I thought, holy crap, kids, you go, what you just did, you just grounded the airplane, you just took the damn tail number off of it. And they looked at me and said, well, that's okay, Ken. I said, uh, we can always spray can the number on it if we need to go somewhere, but it, we can't go to Oshkosh, we may as well paint it. Well, there she is now in all her glory. This is a paint job done by a bunch of teenagers. They stripped it, acid etched it, aladined it, laid a coat of epoxy primer on it, shot it with a good coat of white, uh, snow white jet glow, laid out the stripes, laid out the number, laid out, laid the whole thing out, then painted the uh, atomic red and the black on there. Wow, and looks absolutely they also, fantastic. Uh, they also overhauled that engine during the summertime. And so we tested it. Yeah. No, nope. no, that right there is Casper. And that was the first airplane they did. That was a 67 model. And that one was, that, that picture was actually taken at Oshkosh. Let, me, uh, let me bring up one of the, uh, there you go. There's your engine overhaul. Well, yeah, that's the hammer and, uh, that's the hammer and our little hero doing, uh, putting an engine together. Sure enough. Uh, we're real grateful for the sponsors and support that we're getting with respect to our engines, engine building. Uh, Superior Air Parts and Scott Hayes have been really, really nice to us. Uh, the folks over at Tempest have been really good to us and helping us out with knickknack parts that we need as well. And uh, the guys up at uh, Aircraft Specialties and Services were really good to us as well as Divco helping us uh, source parts and get the engine and components certified, balanced. Uh, that little engine runs like a Singer sewing machine. I mean, it is smooth as silk. We've got balanced pistons in there. They balance the crankshaft, the connecting rods. We've got the airplane put together. Then we put a dynamic balance on there for the prop and ran that up put a few weights here and there. we got that thing dialed in to really, really smooth operation. Well, I, I want to, you know, I, I especially want to commend you for this part of things because not only for everything that you're doing with the with the, the young people there at, at the Tango 31 Air Club, but you look at this even with the engine side. I mean, how many shops now open up and do their own overhauls? They all send everything out, and and the the fact that you're teaching these kids how to do this, and you're you're overhauling your own engine and sending the parts out, of course, Divco, et cetera. Um, we need we need more of this. I think this is great. I love that you're able to do this and be able to keep more keep an aircraft flying, bring another one back. Uh, from the dead. This is right. This is really great. Well, you know, I feel real grateful that I'm able to do this. Uh, you know, the uh, and you know, I people all over the countryside ask me, well, where do you find the kids? That, that wanna, well, they're hanging on the fence. All you got to do is just. I mean, they really are. If you take a look at it, our airports have become the exclusive country club these days where they're the forbidden zone. Uh, way back when the very first uh, episode of uh, Airplane Repo came on, I had, there's the Swamp Hawk. That's their next project right there. Uh, that's the Cessna 172 that hopefully will have a glass uh, cockpit in it when we're done with it and qualify as a TAA uh, airplane. Uh, and that's some of the youngsters there, and we they took the airplane all apart, loaded it on our trailer. And in fact, it's sitting right behind me right now, if you can see it. And well, uh, there you go. Uh, there you go. So, yeah. So they're building wing racks for the wings for it right now, so we can move them around a little more portable than taking up all the room on sawhorses as we speak. That's but, fantastic. Uh, you know, I'm like I said, I'm real grateful for the support we've been able to get from you know those in the industry, and we got a particular shout out to Mark Shower with uh, PS Engineering, who's been real helpful to us with with our audio panels and intercom systems on the airplanes. Yeah, uh, Mark is wonderful. 
Oh yeah, he does a great job. We've got Lag Garden Aviation Insurance who, you know, supports the club. He can't give us a break on the insurance. We just wrote a check for insurance, almost six thousand bucks for two little Cessna one fifties. And well, my gosh, yeah, yeah, my one seventy two sets me back five hundred bucks. You know, and uh, these two one fifties are almost six thousand. And <laughs> Ooh, ah. well, like I said, they can't break anything so bad we can't throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kevin, I want to go back for a minute because I want to give people and leave everybody with a little bit more uh, of the show and a couple other things since that's where so many people know you from. Now, it seems yeah. like one of the things that uh, you are so, so good at is the strategy of how you're going to make something happen, especially when you're dealing with like an air carrier repo that you've done and things like that. Um, I mean, tell us a little bit about some of the things you've done to, to, to lure an aircraft to be there, to, to get, get it, you know, to, to get everything kind of ready so that you can, you can take that plane uh, when you're dealing with, especially air carrier things. I really wanted to wanted to stay up long enough to go over to the terminal just to see the expression on the gate agent's face and all the passengers' face when the airplane that was supposed to be there wasn't there. Uh, hijacked a tug and ran across an airport and grabbed an airplane and pushed it away and never looked back. Uh, I mean, there's... There, I mean, for I chartered I chartered a corporate jet one time. Yeah, so I chartered a jet for eight grand, and I wind up getting the airplane. I took it to where I, took it to where the banker wanted, and then got out of the airplane. I just got out of the airplane. All right, boys. See y'all later. This is mine. So you repoed the airplane by chartering it. Yeah, it was an illegal charter outfit, and they were you know bogus charters and. You know, I think the FAA had something to say about it later on, too. So that was kind of entertaining. And, and anything, any, you've done a lot of this overseas. Anything uh, that you've done there that in, in, in involved uh, being at commercial airports or anything like that? Well, they, they caught me jumping the fence at Rio International, at uh, De Leon, or De Leon International Airport in Rio, trying to get one of my 737s out of there. I was going to just taxied across the airport, but they didn't think it was uh, nice of me to try to jump the fence to get to the airplane. So they gave me the option. They were either going to uh, throw me. Oh, this was an interesting day. <laughs> they were going to throw me under the jailhouse, keep me there until the American Airlines midnight flight from Rio uh, departs. And they were going to escort me to that airplane and send me out of the country. Or they told me just to leave the airport and never come back. And I thought, well, okay, I'll take the second option. I'll leave the airport, but I'm not going to promise I'm not coming back. So, you know, after spending all these hours detained in their little, you know, detention center down there, uh, it was kind of entertaining to uh, let them have them leave, let me go. So for some dumb reason, I had a rent car and I went out and got my rent car, my computer and all that in there. And as I came up off the road to go towards, back towards town and across the, across the water towards town, the cops, they put their cars in the, in, the, uh, in the median and they open the trunk and they have tailgate parties and lunch and what have you, you know. Well, this time, their cops are still sitting there in the median. I come zipping up around the corner there and they pull their guns out and start shooting into the air. <laughs> well, I'm driving this little Fiat something or another with like three cylinders, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm kicking on it. I'm stomping on the gas pedal. I'm ducking in the seat, you know. Oh, shit, I don't know what I did, but these boys are after me. Because I'd just been detained. I mean, I'd been detained all day. And I thought, well, maybe they're just firing a warning shot to make sure I stay out of here. So I get down there to the next exit off the highway to go down towards the Santos, uh, Santos Dumont Airport and down towards downtown Boda, uh, uh, Botafogo and down through there and over towards the Copacabana where I was staying. As I make the next turn off, the cops, same, they pull out their guns and start shooting. I go, oh, crap, what's going on? I'm getting off this highway. I dove off the highway, made the first exit off the highway, and I knew the big, tall, round building was ANAC. That was the uh, Brazilian FAA, if you will. And I knew how to get back to my hotel from there, so if I could just work my way through town, I'd be able to find my way back. Well, I worked my way through town, all right. But I drove right into a gun. 
and it sounded like basic. It was guns and battles going on, and I did not know what to do. Bullets were whizzing around everywhere. I'm stomping on the gas pedal, and I'm on two wheels going around corners in that little old three-cylinder car I was driving. I finally got through the tunnel and back over to the hotel, and I pulled up in front of that hotel, grabbed my computer bag. I think I left the car running and went up to my room. I didn't come out for two days. Finally, there's this little knock on the Mr. Kevin, Mr. Kevin, Mr. Kevin, are you in there? This cute little gal named, uh, she, what was her name? Giselle. Cute little gal named Giselle. She could have been a Disney cartoon character, just, you know, <laughs> with her characteristics and personality and what have you. Are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. What are you doing? We haven't seen you in two days. We want, we're we just making sure you're okay. Uh, anything happened to you? So I told her what happened. And she goes, ah, oh, oh, Mr. Kevin, the druggers, the druggers and the police are in a gun battle. Well, evidently, earlier that day, the drug guys had shot down a police helicopter. And that had began an all-out war in town with the cops going on down there. And in hindsight, the guys that were shooting their guns in the air coming out of the airport weren't shooting them at me. They were just shooting to warn me that there was a battle going on down the road there. <laughs> <laughs> They're literally telling you not to go that way by shooting in the air. Yeah, don't go that way. There's a gun battle going on. Oh, okay, sure. You know, but I thought they were shooting at me or trying to warn me not to come ever come back to the airport again. So, you know, I mean, sometimes you just don't know what it is you don't know. <laughs> oh my God. That, now, one last one. Didn't you have something happen? I think it was over in France where you had there was the, the aircraft. There was a little battle because the aircraft was down with a lean on it for fuel or something along those lines um and, mm. and you had a plane that you were trying to fuel up or, or, or get out of there i thought there was something going on with that at one point no i haven't swiped anything out of france but uh uh been turkey been you know east africa uh berlin a variety of other places uh, there was a 604 Challenger. Oh, yes, there was a 604. There was a Challenger out of Biggin Hill Airport out of, uh, out of England, uh, just southeast of London. Oh, uh, I'll tell you what, the story, I'll tell you, somebody called in and said somebody stole my private jet. They called the cops. So they shut the airspace down over London. And they show up at this place, full dress BDUs with machine guns. They got the airspace shut down. They got tanks driving around the airport, or these little armored vehicles and stuff. And there's some cowboys locked me and my pilots in a cupboard and stole our jet. <laughs> that was entertaining. But, uh, you know, the. Uh, I mean, the hangar doors are slamming open. I'm, out, I'm, I'm walking around doing a recovery and detailed inspection on the airplane. Okay, this has got a dent here. It's got a dent there. I got my camera and I'm doing this stuff. And I hear this door come slamming open and I hear this thunder's uh, entourage of combat boots hitting the hangar floor. And there was a bunch of them. There must have been 18 or 20 bloody bricks beaten to, you know, charging in the hangar over there with their little M16s or whatever they were carrying. And, uh, and I turn around and look at it, oh my God. And so I just raise my hand, hey, you guys here to see me? <laughs> and they all kind of back up a little bit and look, a bunch of white shirt guys come around from behind them, you know, go, it's okay, guys, I think. So they come and approach me, and the rest of the guys surround the airplane, the perimeter, and they're standing guard with the guns. And they begin to interrogate me. And I go, well, no, I'm just here, you know, executing a repossession. Showed them all the paperwork. And well, so where's the cupboard? Where's the cupboard? What what what's a cupboard? Where's where's the cupboard? What is a cupboard? Where's the closet that you lock the pilots and the owner in? I didn't lock anybody in a damn closet. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> she was living she was over there in the luxurious FBO with wine bar over here and a fruit bar over there and big screen luxurious couches. I mean just in all the hotty toddy little tea and what have you that they oh good lord. Anyway, uh, interesting how that turned out. They escorted her out of the building wearing handcuffs. Nice. <laughs> she well, also. in the end, I guess the bottom line is you do not get called unless the people who own the airplane have been doing something wrong to begin with. Well, in that case, they don't even own the airplane. <laughs> there you go.
my clients own the airplane. They're just uh, using it for a while until they uh, either pay it off or don't don't finish paying it off. Got it. Exactly. So anything? Uh, it, will, we, will we see you back on TV at any at any point anytime soon? You're pretty much done with that. Uh, I wouldn't, I would never say never, but, uh, you just never know what's going on. Uh, you know, you'll certainly see me at Oshkosh. You'll certainly see me at Sun and Fun, maybe the NBAA conventions and things of that nature. You know, just being an aviator, just doing what aviators do, yep. uh, which is, you know, which is what, what we do. <laughs> yep. Yep. You know? And if we do see you at, uh, at Sun and Fun or Air Venture, should, uh, should anybody be worried? <laughs> Generally, no, because that's not a time to go swiping anybody's airplane from them, you know. I might I might make sure they get home and then take it after they get home, but, you know, no, I'm not going to do that kind of stuff. There I, got, I got better sense than that. You know, <laughs> so I got too many friends. Excellent. Well, Kevin Lacey, thank you so, so much for joining us tonight on Social Flight Live. It is a, such a such an entertaining time to listen to all your stories. And really, thank you for everything that you're doing with the Tango 31 Aero Club and for kids there, for, for anyone else who, who's watching and helps help support your organization and all the things that you're doing to make more AMP mechanics out there, more pilots, and just help inspire and, and, uh, and keep everyone going, especially kids and especially now. I really do appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure. And I, you know, I look around and I see a lot of people that are all excited that they're about ready to retire and doing all that. And they don't realize that there's so much more they can do after retirement that will keep them young, you know, and enthused and engaged. Yeah. Uh, you know, these youngsters, they keep me on my toes. <laughs> like I said, like I said, they, they can't break anything so bad. We can't throw away. I love that phrase. I'm going to start using that around here. And just hopefully it won't be so bad having to do with our Mustang project that we'll use the same phrase. Yeah, well, good luck <laughs> with that project there. It sounds like kind of exciting. What kind of motor are you going to put on that? That's going to have a, an a LS3 or LM4 uh, a V8 engine on it. Aha, uh -huh. cool. Yes. Sounds well, like fun. Water cool, just like the original uh, Mustang. Everything's all set for it. So uh, we're, we're really excited. All righty then. Looks like a pretty fancy instrument panel you got back there. Yeah, well, uh, we, we are. We want to be able to get this thing to shows back and forth and do a little IFR flight in it also to get there. Well, sometimes, you know, worst part of going to these big shows sometimes is weather. And if you're not equipped to deal with it, then oh well. Yeah, good good friend of mine, Rob Holland, always uh, the aerobatic performer, always says the hardest part of the show is getting there. Yep. That's why I'm not an acro pilot. <laughs> you don't get paid unless you get paid. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Kevin, yes. again, thank you so much for taking time out uh, and uh, for everything that you do with all those kids. And thank you to everyone for taking time out of their evening and joining us here for Social Flight Live. Again, coming up next week, we've got NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command. A little fun uh, with them talking about the beginning and what they do over at NORAD and the Santa Tracker as well. And then Rod Machado is coming up. Mark and Mike Haiti will be coming up. So many other cool things uh, uh, coming down the road. So stay tuned just at socialflightlive.com. And again, good evening to everyone else that's out there. And I wish you all blue skies. Merry Christmas, everybody. Adios.